Good morning, everyone. We are going to get started. We are really excited about our program today for a number of reasons, uh, but um, it is really a pleasure to be in this space. Um, you know, one being it having one of our panelists host us at NYU is amazing, but being in the Rudin Family Forum is another really uh, special um, uh, event for us today. Um, and really this, the idea of this panel came out of a historic moment that we're in, right? With the appointments of extraordinary presidents to three of our major institutions um, that we are immensely proud of. But we'll also take a lot of pride in the fact that each of these leaders are exceptional in their own right. They are serious academics and real world, world practitioners, each with a lifetime of serving the public interest. We would not be here if we weren't very happy to celebrate uh, their rise with or without this milestone moment. President Mills, pioneering research in the field of social work, social work is in the house, <laughs> has helped shape the way cities and states protect victims and implement restorative justice. President Shafiq is, is a renowned economist that has spent her career alleviating poverty at institutions ranging from the World Bank and the IMF to the Bank of England. And President Tetlow, may be one of the youngest leaders in higher education, but this is already her second job at the helm of the nation's foremost Jesuit schools. And the first was Loyola University in Baltimore, which she helped bring back from the, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> from financial brain, boost enrollment and expand into online education. He has always had a very close partnership with the major universities because we recognize them as New York's greatest assets in attracting growing talent. We have always been a university town. And at this city, in this city, we embark on this journey of economic recovery. These institutions are in very good hands. And as you know what they say, if you want something done, you give it to a woman. So, so to, to lead today's discussion, we have a good friend, Regina Myers, who many of us know from her years bringing the public and private sectors together to bring Brooklyn Bridge Park, to build Brooklyn Bridge Park. Today, she leads the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership and sits on our Abney Women's Steering Committee. And to introduce Regina, it is my pleasure to bring up Samantha Rudin Earls and e the now the co-CEO of Rudin Management. Family's <laughs> commitment to higher education. And I'm sorry, can we just have her mom and dad stand up? I'm sorry. The Rudins are an institution not only for NYU, but also for this city, for all that they have done. Um, and we are very blessed to have them uh, not only at this event today, but to continue to service uh, the city and the and Abney um, in their philanthropic endeavors. And um, their family's commitment to higher education in its institution are reflected in too many buildings and programs to count, uh, including where we are today. But it's also fitting that uh, Samantha is here to uh, introduce the event because she is an NYU alum. <laughs> So thank you, NYU Wagner, for hosting us today. It's great to be in the Rudin Family Forum. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Sam to the podium. Thank you, Melva. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction, so special. Um, so as Melva said, thank you so much for joining us today. This is an exciting and historic panel women leaders in higher education. 
and I'm Samantha, chair of ABNY Women. And on a personal note, as Melva said, my parents are here, but also I want you to know that my parents met at NYU's um, Stern School of Business. I think it was Finance 101 when the sparks flew. So I think I can safely say that there is a chance that I would not be standing here today if it weren't for NYU. And as Melva said, I'm a proud graduate of the Tisch School of the Arts. And I also believe that one of the greatest gifts someone can receive is a higher education. Um, ABNY Women was started in 2016 to provide a forum for civic minded women in, in, across industries to come together to address the issues facing women in the workplace. It was also at the time when there was the promise of the first female president of the United States of America. Since then, women in leadership roles have continued to make huge progress, which is evident in the many accomplishments of our panelists today. Linda Mills, president of NYU, Manoush Shafiq, president of Columbia, and Tanya Tetlo, president of Fordham. Thank you so much. These, they, they all are women to hold historic new positions in their institutions. And we are excited to have these three inspirational women here today to talk about their goals and visions. Before I introduce our moderator, I do want to take a moment to mention Melva, another woman has, who has been historic in our own span here at ABNY and ABNY Women. In January or at the end of December, Melva, who's been ABNY's first female CEO, will be stepping down to pursue pursue her own PhD, and we're so proud of you. And Melva, it has just been an honor to partner with you, to learn from you, to watch you change, innovate, and transform the landscape of ABNY, as well as infuse our women's group with your views, your power, your style, and grace. We will all miss you, but we know you will stay close. So please join me in giving Melva a round of applause. I also want to thank NYU's Rudin Center for Transportation, especially Sarah Kaufman, the Wagner School of Public Service for hosting us this morning, and the Abney and Rudin teams for everything you did to make today possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce Regina Meyer, president of Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Regina is tasked with supporting Downtown Brooklyn's emergence as a center for creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation, which also happens to be the home of NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. Um, yes, Regina, form sorry, sorry, we're just warming it up with NYU. You guys are going to take over. Um, so, um, Regina formerly led Brooklyn Bridge Park, transforming it from an industrial site to one of the most spectacular parks in our city. And she is a devoted ABNY Women Steering Committee member. Thank you, Regina, for leading our panel today, for moderating. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks, Melva and Sam, for um, those lovely introductions. Um, and big shout out to Abney, the entire team, for making this morning possible. It's, it's really um, promises to be a great discussion. And I think as we've been discussing over the past few years with the Abney Women's Groups, for those of you who are new, is that we've really been addressing um, really what's great about New York City in terms of its female leadership and really understanding from our female leadership what in particular um, they are addressing. And we've learned a great deal from our female leaders. Um, we've had sessions on media, um, child care, care, other aspects of government, just uh, just to name a few in the past couple of years. And it's it's been very, very powerful. Um, today, though, is historic because we have historic appointments of three um, female presidents to our major universities. And uh, although there's been other leaders in other other colleges and schools in New York City, um, the leaders of NYU, Columbia, and Fordham University coming together for us with us this morning to really describe their um, ambitions in their new roles, their challenges in their new roles, and what it means for New York City to lead these prestigious um, educa um, educational institutions. Um, in terms of their bios, they are 
incredible. And so I am not going to read them. And you heard a little bit from Melva, um, but I'll briefly say a, f a couple more words ab about each one of them. And then honestly, I really hope to hear about their experiences both in the academia and in the workplace um, through their comments, because I think that is really what is so um, special about this morning session. Um, Linda G. Mills is the 17th president of NYU. She also is the Lisa Ellen Goldberg Professor of Social Work, Public Policy, Law, and the Executive Director of the NYU Center on Violence and Recovery. Her areas of focus, as you heard um, from Melva, include um, scholarly focus on trauma, bias, and domestic violence, and her extensive research on domestic violence and restorative justice has been adopted in a part of, in, across our country. Um, she previously served as NYU's vice chancellor and senior vice provost for global programs and university life. And I like to think that's one of the reasons NYU is in downtown Brooklyn, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Um, Manish Shafiq is the 20th president of Columbia University. Um, she started also this summer. And um, she's a distinguished econ economist who served in senior leadership roles at the World Bank, at the IMF, at the Bank of England, and a really broad focus on economic issues, including global poverty, the environment, the debt crises, um, and, of, and um, the Arab Spring. She also holds uh, the title of Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And before she came just to New York, she served as the president of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And then Tanya, Tanya Tetlow is the president of Fordham University. She's been here since the summer before last, right, um, is a legal scholar who examines the intersection of equal protection and criminal law. Um, with her Jesuit roots, she not only is the first um, woman to lead Fordham University, but also the first lay person. Um, before um, serving at Fordham, she was the president of Loyola University in New Orleans, was also an assistant um, U.S. attorney, attorney at the Eastern District at Louisiana, and then in her charitable work, um, you should also know that she also was a key person in bringing the New Orleans library system back on and as a real innovator after Hurricane Katrina. Um, so with those introductions, I really want to get into the questions um, because there we have so many things to discuss. Um, I really want to start with the historical significance of your or each of your appointments um, and really want to hear from each of you how you feel the appointment means to you professionally at your, the schools you're leading and also personally. We're, we're a, a very personal group in that way. <laughs> um, I want to start with, we're going to start alphabetically for the first round. Um, Linda, Linda, why don't you start? Usually I'm in the middle of the alphabet and so I, I, I'm not the first one, uh, but for, for some reason on this panel. Um, so personally and professionally, you know what, what I have found. So let me tell you a little story because it's a personal story and it's a fun story. The um, chair of the board of trustees for NYU when we were announcing my appointment was quite intentional in not mentioning the fact that I was the first woman in 192 years to be appointed to NYU. He was intentional because he believed uh, wholeheartedly that that wasn't the reason I got the job and was worried that if he had mentioned it or that if he'd mention it, that in fact, that's what everybody might focus on. And of course, after the announcement, that was the only question I got, which was, you know, how does it feel? So there was that paradox. Maybe I wasn't as prepared as a result of his insistence that he wasn't going to mention it and that it wasn't, he, he didn't want it to be an issue. But what I have found in this journey now and in talking to people is how important it is to them. And so many young girls and, and, and young professionals, but also um, those at NYU who feel as though it really signals opportunity for them. And so, you know, I embody the role, I'm in it, I'm doing it, I am who I am, I've always been a woman, I don't know what else it might feel like, but <laughs> the, the, the larger point is I have to and recognize the importance and uh, to other people 
of my being in this role and um, and and being responsive and sensitive to the fact that it's so important to them. So that's what I'd say on the personal side. On the professional side, it's just amazing, and I'll leave it at that, to be in the company of these other great women, Samantha, Ophelia, you know, so many great women in the room. And let me say that one of the key reasons I'm sitting here is because many great men help me get to this point. So it's a really, it's a complicated story. It's not a simple all women story, but uh, I'd leave you with that. Manish? Well, my experience was quite similar in the sense that um, it wasn't highlighted and it was every press headline says, Columbia appoints first women in over 200, first woman in the first, in over 270 years. So it was uh, very similar and very similarly, you know, I don't get up every morning and thinking I'm the first woman president of Columbia University. It's just not like that. There's too much to do to think about that stuff. So um, so it doesn't feature prominently in my mind, but it does feature prominently in other people's minds, including staff and faculty um, for whom it's really important to see women in leadership positions. Um, and so I, I don't I, I don't often think about it, but I do have to remind myself sometimes that it is really significant for others to see that. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is I've been in very male-dominated fields for much of my career. I was very often the only woman in the room in economics, which is a very male discipline. Um, so I'm really enjoying being surrounded by other women. Uh, in fact, I've almost, you know, there's almost a male problem at the moment. <laughs> I, I, I sort of, I probably need a couple more men on my team. And, you know, I went to the Ivy Plus presidents and it's six of the eight are now women. And so, you know, I'm. it's so interesting how things have flipped after such a long time. Uh, but of course, you know, one has to, we'll talk about this later, but, you know, having more women at the top is great, but you you know we're not there yet in terms of other the, the you know or in other industries and in across the middle of the spectrum. So, so the uh, the same. There is such a weird disconnect between just being us and looking out through our eyes and representing visible progress to the world, right? Which is exciting. And it's an opportunity which we use. People hear our voices in a slightly different way. Um, and I get asked a lot about whether there's opposition to it. And it's hard to know because people mostly don't tell you that. Although I had one story from back at my previous institution where I sat down with an elderly donor and I said, well, I take being the first non-priest very seriously, right? Because that's also a jarring move for um, both of those institutions and about keeping the Jesuit Catholic tenor of the university of understanding it profoundly. And he's interrupted me to say, Tanya, it's not that you're not a priest that bothers people. It's that you're a woman. And <laughs> And for once in my life, I didn't sort of think of the right answer fuming a month later in the shower. I said, well, you know, there's nothing much I can do about that that you would approve of. You know, it's perfect because it went right over his head. I tell this story without fear that he'll have any memory of ever saying it. Um, and he he gave us a generous donation later. So I um, I think that... It does some days feel like they let us do these jobs when they become became unbearably hard. I'll say, especially this month. But um, but I, it's it is both one of the industries that has the highest percentage of women at the helm. Right, we're we're above thirty percent, and that taking over the Ivies, I think, was a, a real leap. Um, and I also have noticed that it's not just that they're willing to hire women, but Linda and I have something in common and that we both have specialized in domestic violence, which is an incredibly marginalizing field for women to go into, and that that didn't stand in our way and hopefully also was a bonus and an understanding of how important and valuable that was of, of looking at um, the role of women in society, of how we are treated, of power and struggle um, being something important instead of something other. So 
Uh, can I follow on? This is a little off script, but talking about your areas of expertise, how has that um, led you to where you are today? I mean, that, that is fascinating, Tanya, that you raised that right away. Um, I, you know, I've, I've worked on a few issues, uh, criminal justice, racism in criminal justice and domestic violence, and they're all, uh, depressingly relevant to running a university, right? So, um, and that way, I suppose they have helped. But I think, you know, for us, the deep work of knowing what faculty do and of solving problems, and I think we have had in common being academics, as as Melba pointed out, who are unusually practical in how we apply our work and want it to matter in an immediate way. And I think that has stood us well, I imagine. Um, want to um, talk about higher education and access to it. Um, obviously, this is something that's all on our front of mind. Um, the U.S. Census Bureau um, tells us that only 40 percent of New Yorkers in their 20s have bachelor's degrees. And we're all also painfully aware of the cost of education across the board. It's increased 140 percent over the past two decades, which is far outpaces inflation, especially in, in a very expensive city like New York. Um, can you speak about your institution's ongoing efforts to strengthen the pipeline of students to your un who coming to your university, but also speak to increasing the share of economic diver diversification within your student bodies, who have, so we, we more people can have access to higher education? I'm going to start this time with Tanya. So. Uh we are stuck in a really dumb pricing model in higher ed. So tuition, which is the statistic you cite, is what signals quality. And if we aren't expensive, people will think we're not good. But we very rarely charge that actual full price. And when you look at what universities in fact charge after they provide financial aid and merit scholarships, um, it has been really fairly flat in the last decade. And um, in New York, for example, the average student um, price for uh, tuition, room and board at a private four-year institution, the average that they actually pay is about $29,000. And so, it is a model that's really daunting to students in high school who don't understand that they won't know what the college really costs until they go through the admissions process, the FAFSA form. It's unwieldy and dumb and, and a terrible place to be, but we don't have a way to get out of it short of colluding in violation of antitrust laws, right? So um, for us, it's a focus on financial aid of meeting need, of, of doing that work. Um, Fordham was founded in 1841 for all of those Irish Catholic immigrants streaming into the city by the millions and um, made a place that they were welcome and welcome Jewish students and others who were not welcome elsewhere. So that is our foundation. And we are proudly still 48 percent students of color. We are um, uh almost 40% students from New York State um, and a majority from the tri-state area. So this is part of our foundation, um, but that greater effort of affordability, that crisis that we're in, in many ways, and I'll let them take over this conversation, but um, we've had this huge public disinvestment from higher ed, right? Pell Grants used to be enough to cover tuition, room, and board at most private schools, and they have faded to being a tiny pittance. And I think we're stuck in this world where higher ed was seen as a public good. In other countries, um, it is. It's, it's an understanding that we have had with the GI Bill that it fuels global competitiveness for this country. It makes meritocracy real. And instead, we pull back from that. And imagine, for example, if high schools stopped being seen as a public good, if high schools became something that everyone had to pay for on their own, and then we complained about how they were unaffordable and there's not enough in ROI of a high school degree, right? It's a, it's a stupid system we're in. And if we were to go back to that kind of understanding that just like K through 12, higher education is important for this country country, for its citizens, for our ability to compete in the world, we'd be in a much different place. Um, uh, President Shafiq? Sure. So, um, so Columbia is needs blind. And so any student who applies who gets in will get an aid package that will support them. Uh, we Try, we don't use loans, and so that aid package will include things outside of loans. And, and as Tanya said, the sticker price looks really scary. The net 
tuition actually paid is about $12,000 and half our students get financial aid. Um, so it is a bit of a deceptive model. The sticker price bears no relationship to the actual cost. And we've got a sort of system for better or worse where Wealthy students who can afford to pay the sticker price cross-subsidize the poor students. And about 30% of our students are Pell eligible, which means they're very low income and get a full, a full ride. So that's on the kind of core tuition thing. The other thing that I think is I'm really proud of at Columbia is we have something called the School of General Studies, which is a for non-traditional undergraduates, average incoming age, 27. Uh, and we have a couple of thousand students who are in that program. Many of them are veterans. In fact, we have more veterans uh, than all the other Ivies combined. Many of them are ballet dancers or athletes or people for whatever reason didn't go straight into college because they were doing other things. Uh, and 40% of those tr students come from community colleges. Many of them come from New York community colleges and they spend two years in community college. And then we take all the kids from the honors programs of these community colleges and bring them to Columbia. And the thing that I'm super proud of is that when they graduate, they have the same GPA as the Columbia college students. Uh, and so it's, you know, amazing outcomes for people who took a non-traditional path. And we also take, I should also mention, a lot of students coming out of prison. Uh, and we have a prison program where we teach in the prisons, and then our faculty then recruit those students to come to Columbia. Uh, so we're finding creative ways to work within the constraints of the system that we have to make sure that our campuses are truly diverse. And I would like to think, you know, many of us talk at the moment in the U.S. about how everybody's in their own bu bubble and in their own silo, and you can completely shelter yourself from different sorts of views. For better or worse, university campuses are still one of the places in the world where we still have quite a lot of diversity, both socioeconomic, racial, and in terms of diverse points of views. And that's a huge benefit to society that we continue to have that. So um, my colleagues have talked about the sort of big issues in higher ed, and I think sticker price is really a problem, and it would be... Um, I suppose, legal for us to talk about the broader issue of how do we actually tell a more honest story about the cost of higher education. NYU, obviously committed to access for many, many years now, um, has, um, uh, much like both Columbia and uh, Fordham, invited people into our educational system who wouldn't otherwise have access. So I'm not going to, we've, we've sort of covered that issue and NYU has a lot uh, to be proud of in terms of inviting immigrants and, and others, particularly as it relates to the city, into an educational experience that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten, having offered financial aid. I recently announced at my inauguration that those who earn $100,000 or less will get free tuition at NYU, for example. But that doesn't address the much larger question of access that I really want to pick up on that you talked about, which is um, how few people, how so many more people are deciding somehow affirmatively that a college education is either not necessary or not desirable. And we talked earlier about women and access, and it's true that in some disciplines, women still lack. But the bottom line is in this country, which is something that most people don't realize, the people who aren't going to college are young boys. And we have a crisis because those are the people who will, sh who will and can shape the future of this country. And if they aren't getting an education, what we know about an education is that it shapes a much broader view of the world. And we absolutely need that broader, more collective, more engaged, more together sense of the world, and particularly among young men. So I just want to say that it's so interesting to be, right, the first woman president now sitting here advocating for an education for young men. Uh, after all the great progress we have made, still, you know, a lot to do, but I do just want to underscore the importance of this issue. Do you have um, a declining male? Yes, all, all yes. universities do. Actually, it's a global phenomenon. There are now more women in university everywhere in the world, including South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, than men. It's a global phenomenon.
In many ways, it's women catching up and exceeding and men being stagnant. But in the U.S., 59% of college students are female. Sobering. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yes. When you think about men's uh, leadership in extremism, for example. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Well, and just. There's a lot to say here. There's a lot to say. (laughs) And I also think it's partly fueled by this myth that it's not worth it to go to college. And the evidence is so clear that the rates of return to higher education are so high and it is so worth it. There is one caveat, which is it's not worth it to go to a for-profit university. I have to say that. And a lot of what you hear about these poor students who have very high student debts, who can't pay them back, are people who went to for-profit universities who sell them a bill of goods, charge them a lot, make them take out loans, and they come out with skills that can't find them jobs. And so it's important to remember that all of us are non-profit universities who have a a social mandate for the welfare of our students. And that's, that's where the problem is. And the people pushing that myth are politicians and journalists who themselves are sending their children to college, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, go back to um, our role as ABNY for, for a moment and um, talk about how great New York City is. Because yeah. <laughs> one of, for us as ABNY members, one of the reasons we really believe we're a great city is our institutions, as Melba said, and I also believe that one of the reasons your campuses are so compelling is because they're in the city of New York. Um, I want to talk, though, a little bit about your expansions, because historically, all of your campuses have modernized over the past several decades, and some have been in the the news more recently than not. Um, But it really is important for us to discuss in that mode, um, your perspective on your institution's role in the city of New York, in your communities, and how you're good neighbors. Um, why don't you start, Professor Shafi, uh, President? <laughs> Please, just call me me. Um, so, uh, so we take the commitment very seriously. Some of you may not know that our official name is Columbia University in the city of New York. That is our full name. And we are very committed to being a good citizen in New York. And there are many dimensions to what to what you've asked. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, One is our role uh, as a neighbor in Upper Manhattan. And some of you will know, well, I'll just give you the headline numbers. Columbia University contributes about $11 billion of economic activity and economic benefit to New York City every year. That's a very big number. That includes creating about 50,000 jobs, both direct and indirect. We employ about 20,000 people directly, but indirectly fifty over 55,000. Uh, and all of those people get wages and all of that benefits the city. We're building a new campus in Manhattanville, about five or six blocks north of our current Morningside campus. And we're taking a different approach than our historic campus had, which, you know, is a much more traditional campus with gates and it's very imposing and lots of sort of, you know, grand buildings, which look a little scary to go into. Uh, Manhattanville uh, campus has public access on all the ground floors. There are lots of local restaurants. Uh, There's a climbing wall. There's a science lab for local children to come in and work with our scientists. Uh, it's, It's a completely sort of different model. We've also made 350 commitments to the local community as part of building that campus. Everything ranging from providing free bus services to having local community members audit classes to access to all of our athletic facilities for children on the weekends to our dental school providing dental services in local schools uh, as part of that agreement. And we're monitoring and tracking all of those commitments. The other final thing I'd say is that I, I think another big part of what we do is help New York City solve its big challenges. My favorite story, and I can give several others, is the story of the L train, since I think you may be a Brooklynite. (laughs) Um, So some of you may remember after Hurricane Sandy, uh, the tunnel through which the L train goes was severely damaged. And they were going to have to close the L train for about a year and a half, uh, which would have caused, as you can imagine, huge disruption in the city. They brought this problem, the the governor at the time brought the problem to the Columbia Engineering School, and the Columbia engineers figured out a way to fix the tunnel without having to close the train and save the city $100 million. 
And I hold that up as a really good example of the kind of intellectual capacity that we all have in our institutions that we can mobilize to help the city. And I'm in the process of trying to identify other such opportunities, including if anyone's from the Bronx, we're doing some work on the armory in the Bronx to try and get our architectural school to come up with some great ideas to how to transform the armory as a, as a community hub. And so I, I think we're really up for that. I'm, I, I'm, I want to create something. We have something called Columbia Global, which does stuff all over the world, but I want to create something called Columbia Local, which provides a platform so that we can work and partner with people in the city uh, to address the big challenges that New York City is facing and make it even greater. Um, President Tetlow. So Senator Moynihan said once that if you want a great city, you build a great university and wait 200 years. Um, that that we fuel so much of just the ecosystem of the jobs we create, as you've heard, um, but also the educational opportunity and in hidden ways, the innovation, right, that you've just demonstrated that that fuels a great city, that fuels an economy. Um, Fordham has been more compact the last time we spread out our campus was when Lincoln Center itself was built and our campus was part of that project. But um, we have taken very seriously the fact that's true for all three of us is that our the fates of our institutions are entirely intertwined with the fate of New York, and we know that. And it is both a proud part of the service we do, but it's also part of our survival. And at Fordham, um, we get to be part of the ecosystem of the Jesuits and the church itself, right? So we're deeply embedded in the Bronx, in in um, a world of pro parochial schools and parishes and Catholic charities and the frontline work that they've always done. When I read the history of the university, the Jesuits were bringing students to Rikers Island in the 1850s, right? So we have um, been part of those deep and abiding connections with um, little nonprofits in the Bronx of convening them, bringing them together. And when my parents who met at Fordham, so it's the reason I exist, which I'm, when they call you, it's it's quite the guilt trip, right? Um, is uh, they were there in the late 60s and were part of a group of young Jesuits who, when the South Bronx was burning, pulled together community leaders, religious leaders, and found a way to put a stop to the arsons that were happening from landlords to really bind together the community and to keep it from continuing to spread to, to hurt more people. And so um, we are proud of continuing to do that work. But, you know, this is New York is a college town more than it realizes or brags about. And that is a huge part of its success. We don't just educate New Yorkers. I bet many of you in this room came to New York from elsewhere to go to one of our schools and then stayed, right? And so that ethos is critical. And I think, um, I hope that we can do more and more of working together, of finding ways um, to bring together our sprawling, complicated campuses and faculties to do more with the city, with government, with nonprofits, to be even more effective is what I'm excited about but you will never know all the ways that we have quietly, secretly helped. So, um, you know, NYU spans from the Institute of Fine Arts, which is uptown, uh, all the way to uh, Brooklyn. And um, we've all talked about our impact, but I want to say two things. One is that being in Brooklyn, uh, as long as we're here and, and celebrating this morning, um, has been transformative for NYU and for Brooklyn. And it, I think that that really is the, you know, sort of one of the latest success stories of the ways in which a university's intertwined relationship with the city transforms a place. Um, and not only that, but also provides opportunities for answering the big questions. What I want to do is bring this back to the original question that you asked us, which is, you know, what makes this group of people different and the, the transformational potential. And that is that as women, um, and this I think comes very naturally to us, and, and Tanya invited us over for dinner. We have met before, I want you to know. And um, it, it is so obvious that we are committed in a connected way. And that together, we can make a very big difference. We're not, you know, I think we are now moving into the 
this period where rather than competitive, we have to be collaborative. The problems are too big. The issues are too large and looming, and we need to work together in order to address them. And I think in this group, you get just that. So. Um, I did want to um, talk one more about one more um, question that's really been on all of our minds since last summer um, in the national news, and that is the historic U.S. Supreme Court decision um, effectively ending race uh, conscious admission. Um, this is something that um, I know has affected all of you at the highest level of uh, policy, uh, but really wanted to understand how you are looking forward in terms of moving forward and in within a new con con constitutional framework. Um, President Tetlow. Well, I'm really frustrated by the opinion on all sorts of levels, but um, we will have to see. I mean, at Fordham, we've had these longstanding pipelines um, that Jesuits have built, uh, grammar schools and high schools that are opportunity schools. We, we recruit our... Number one feeder school you'll be happy to know is Brooklyn Tech. Um, we, uh, but we'll have more competition in all of those pipelines because that's a race neutral thing that we're all allowed to do. Um, I, it will matter as we compete for students of color to be a place that is already diverse, to be a place that is warm and inclusive. And I think we'll all need to properly double down on how we do that. It's not entirely within our power, but to use every lever we have to create that kind of environment. Um, my my hope is that uh, for the schools that could afford to do more on issues of class and have chosen not to, which is a very narrow set of schools, um, you know, schools other than these two that have the wealth to afford to be more generous and to bring in more poor students generally, that is not a substitute for thinking about race, but it, it heavily overlaps and it matters in its own right. And I do hope we'll have more progress there, that, that some of those highly selective schools that have focused on race but not on class, um, that famously have educated more of the top 1% of American families than the bottom 60% combined, that we will see some progress there might be one tiny silver, not not tiny, but silver lining of this. Um, but it, it remains to be seen. I will remind you that most of higher ed never used affirmative action. They have applicant pools that are incredibly diverse and they are diverse because America is diverse, right? So this, we'll see the impact of this on the most selective schools and then how it plays out. And we're all a little bit at a loss about what we're allowed to do and what we're not. So we're, we're figuring it out as we go. So as the most selective school. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so so affirmative action has certainly helped us become a lot more diverse at Columbia. You know, you if you remember, Columbia, when it started, only permitted white Christian men to be at Columbia. Protestant. Protestant. That's right. Not Catholics, only Anglicans, uh, Protestants and Anglicans. That was most of its history. Uh, and then sort of, you know, in the 19th century, they allowed a few Jews and Catholics in and and then not till the 1980s were women allowed in. So, you know, this has been a long time coming, so to speak. Um, and I, I think we're using the Supreme Court decision to really uh, force ourselves to really rethink our admissions in a holistic way. Yes, we cannot have a race checkbox anymore, according to the law. And of course, we will comply with the law. Um, but I think we're also beginning to think, what else can we do to make sure that our student body is truly diverse? And what does diversity mean in the modern world? Does that, what does that mean in terms of international students? What does that mean in terms of socioeconomic diversity? So we're looking at all of those variables actively. One of the things that I think is a real opportunity for us is, um, is looking at enhancing our relationship with New York City public schools. Um, New York City public schools are highly segregated, and uh, we uh, we are Columbia University in the city of New York. That's our name. Uh, it's in the name, and so so looking at a way to draw more heavily on New York City public schools could be a part of our response to this decision and to make those link stronger and develop a stronger pipeline uh, through that. And we are looking very actively at what are being called pathway programs to help people to get into Columbia from a very diverse background and really investing heavily in those. Very similar strategy. 
since I touched it in the wrong way. Um, <laughs> We're using very similar strategies. And what will happen is that New York City students will have tremendous choice, is my guess, because we are all doing similar strategies. At NYU, we have 19 schools. Our admissions is uh, focused very much centrally. And what we've done is created what, what we've called the Access Collaborative, which is from every school come together to ask the question, what is your what what are your access points to New York City, the tri-state area and beyond to schools that will be that that will um, provide us with a diverse student body. I'm being very careful in my choice of words. So all that's to say we have come together as a team, about 25 people, to ask and answer the question, where is NYU already planted well and how do we leverage that? But the bottom line is New York City students in particular will have tremendous opportunities going forward in terms of their education and that may and choice. And that's a good thing. So maybe that's a small silver lining to such a devastating decision. How do you effectuate that? How do you see that being effectuated, though? I mean, in terms of New York City, I mean, do you think high schools or? Yeah, this is very much we're working at the high school level, but also a lot of our access is at uh, K through 12. But it is at the high school level where I think um, all the universe, local university, we've already said, uh, alluded to it, um, will be looking to particular to to working across New York City to access a diverse student body. And community, sorry. And community colleges. Uh, so we already take huge numbers of community college students through our School of General Studies, but also our postgraduate program. So we've just launched a pilot, for example, where you spend two years at community college in New York City, two years in our general studies program, and then two years in our School of Public Health, because we discovered after COVID that our public health workforce was not very diverse. And so this was a way that we could get students ready, you know, and they would have a clear path from community college to Columbia to a master's in public health. We've taken in our first cohort and we're looking at other opportunities now, maybe working with community college students in their first year, not waiting for them to finish their associate degree, but start in their first year, admit them to Columbia in their first year so they know that they've got a path. And then in their second year, they can take courses to kind of get ready to transfer into Columbia. So I think there's a lot of creativity in this space. And all of it will help, but this is coming on the heels of COVID wiping out 30 years of progress and closing the opportunity gap in K through 12 overnight. And so we in higher ed can try to build these pipelines, but what you're hearing is we're also going to be competing a lot for the same students, right? We can't fix this alone, and there, there needs to be more attention to the fact of the ticking time bomb of that COVID impact on educational opportunity generally, especially with kids who were very small when it happened, who delayed reading, and of the ways that we don't have real meritocracy in this country yet, right? Until we get there, we can't can't, um, it's it's too late for us to entirely make up for it at the college level. Oh, sobering, but a lot of work to do. Well, I'm glad that the three of you are on the forefront of thinking about this, especially for New Yorkers. I would admit I'm parochial that way, um, but leading the nation as, as well. Um, and I appreciate all of your comments this morning. Melva tells me we're out of time. She's been whispering to me. Um, 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 so thank you so much.